I want you to take a moment and close your eyes and imagine traveling in time. Some process that would let you go backward in time to witness the events that changed history or into the future to see if mankind survives and then to return to the present with a knowledge of what will happen tomorrow. The process is intriguing, even mind-boggling, but the science is more real than imagined. Explore the possibilities on the exciting new frontier of time control and time travel with the Anderson Institute, which is dedicated exclusively to advancing the study and development of time control capabilities. Joining me today is the founder of the Anderson Institute, David Lewis Anderson, and he's going to be talking about what I just said and the reality of it and how it can change the world. Welcome, David. Hello, Hillary. Thank you for the nice uh, greeting, and it's such a pleasure to be here on the Hillary, Hillary Ramo show. Well, it's, it's, I'm glad to have you here. In fact, I've been wanting to bring you on the show for a while now, so we were actually able to finally coordinate your appearance. And uh, I want to get started because we have so much to cover in only an hour. So first of all, David, how did you come into this whole topic? Um, where, did, where did this begin for you? What was your journey? Well, my journey actually began by accident. I've been working now for more than 25 years in the field of uh, studying the physical nature of time. Uh, it began actually uh, a little more than 25 years ago when I entered the United States Air Force as a scientist working for Air Force Systems Command and, and also doing some projects uh, with the DARPA. Um, I left the Air Force after discovering some... Uh, what I wanted to say, it, through, through the work I did in the Air Force, I accidentally discovered some relationships with regards to time and space that fascinated me, and I actually left the Air Force and formed an organization called the Time Technology Research Center, and eventually uh, what has become today the Anderson Institute. Uh, my background, uh, just so people know a little bit about me, uh, my focus is really in space-time physics and special relativity. Uh, I do also focus on global community service as an ambassador for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And my educational background uh, is primarily um, in the area of science with degrees in engineering, physics, uh, and philosophy from universities in West Virginia, California State, and Minnesota. Hmm. So you have a very, very powerful background. Now, I want to ask him, the first thing that really hit me when I looked at your website and was researching the show is, what is the difference between time control and time travel? Well... Um, there's two differences. Uh, first off, when you work in uh, as a physicist like I do and the colleagues we work with, uh, many times people will chuckle at, at the words when you say time travel, even though we've known for decades that time travel is possible with the laws of our math and physics, people tend to chuckle uh, to discuss it uh, without that, uh, that unnecessary label. But also... When we look at what's happening around the world, which is absolutely remarkable right now, the first applications of this new technology um, will be for time control applications, not necessarily for sending people backwards and forwards in time. And, you know, for example, uh, some of the first products that time control technology will be deployed for will be, for example, in medical fields, for the, uh, uh, the, the development and sale of uh, stasis fields for medical applications, for chambers to accelerate uh, test research for um, uh, different types of research and development applications, perhaps for uh, viewing and recording history, uh, not as much as sending people backwards and forward in time. So the first products that will hit the market will be uh, more time control uh, devices versus time travel devices. Now, you were working in the Air Force, and they let you leave to pursue this work privately, and the government uh, is, is not necessarily involved in your work, but do you feel that they're waiting for you to develop this technology to, to use it for themselves? Well, uh, that's a complicated question. Actually, I wanted to pursue my work in the in the United States Air Force. I was working as a scientist at Edwards Air Force Base and uh, the Air Force Flight Test Center, and I had presented uh, my findings uh, to uh, the Flight Test Center and Air Force Systems Command. And at the time, it was outside of the scope of the mission, so I actually decided to leave. And two weeks prior to leaving, the Air Force finally realized what I was proposing, and they declined my separation. 
I actually had to go to uh, a request a con- congressional inquiry with Senator Rockefeller in West Virginia to get to leave the Air Force because that time, uh, by that time, I actually had been already taking the first steps to set up the Time Technology Research Center. Um, so. Um, I would have liked to have done the work in the military, and I'm very grateful because as a young person, they gave me great opportunities I never would have had anywhere else, uh, but I couldn't do it. Now, today, our work includes work kind of partnerships with both private agencies and governments, not just in the United States, but also in India, uh, Japan, and South Korea, and hopefully very soon in uh, the former Soviet Union and China. Do you find that you, as you progress through your research, do you find that the the technology itself is kind of like a, a Pandora's box, so to speak, where if you, you know, you do really create the technology that allows this to happen, that it may, if it falls into the wrong hands, be used for the wrong reasons? Yes, that's uh, that's one of the greatest challenges. It's actually one of the reasons why we've stepped forward, and many of our colleagues around the world uh, working in this research every day are beginning to step forward, is because when you look at time control technology, we're really talking about a technology that can change our concept of reality in ways that are very difficult for people to even begin to comprehend. And when we look at now uh, the the unprecedented a precedented acquisition of the, uh, the the capabilities in this technology, it really puts us in a critical position as a human society. If you really look at the past, for example, with nuclear en- en- energy or any other technology, the higher the level of knowledge we as a human society have developed, the greater we were able to develop our sense of moral responsibility. And if we look at human ethics, we've always seen that there's a clear principle that says the greater our knowledge and power, the greater the need for moral responsibility as a foundation to guide how we use it. And until recently, even though many would say we've danced on the edge of the razor blade, that principle has been highly effective. But the problem is now today is that our human capacity for moral reasoning, why it has kept pace with these developments in the past, uh, is not keeping pace with the possible ramifications uh, of time control technology, and that's one of the reasons why we step forward. The gap has grown too big. Too many agencies are now experimenting with time control technologies, not the low power variants that began back in the 1960s, but the power and capabilities of technology have grown so much, they're being used without understanding the possible ramifications of using them improperly and without the ability to predict what the results will be. And doing that without understanding the impact on human society, whether it be human society as a whole or one individual, really is not a a wise thing to do. Mm. So basically, if somebody gets a hold of this, there has to be a, a sense of transparency in order to keep it, <clears throat> to keep the ethics involved on a higher level, don't you think? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of our campaigns, and we're developing a strategy with several of our colleagues in India and Japan, um, is the first step, number one, is exactly what you said, Hillary, is transparency and disclosure. We need to uh, take this out of the arena of of private uh, uh, funding and uh, buried deep in these government, uh, uh, different government uh, research initiatives, bring it into the public eye. We, of course, have to educate, because as we've been going through this for the last several decades, um, we've learned some remarkable things. Not just, it's, and actually, many of the things we've learned have less to do with the technology, but more about understanding what really is the true makeup of this universe we live in and the opportunity that that knowledge has to help us grow individually. But after that education, we need to then to determine as a human society how do we guide not just the use but the development. And then after that, of course, we have to monitor to make sure the technology is used prudently. When you talk about this topic, when I listen to you speak on this and when I'm, when I'm reading over your material on your website, what comes to mind is a, a sense of uh, Nikola Tesla's work where he had the best intentions to come out with something that would really provide for, you know, example, free energy for people and people would be able to really live better lives. And the intention was really wonderful, but what happened is exactly what you just described where it went into private, you know, private funding and government control and, and has really not done that. What are the dangers of this technology and uh, how would you suggest that the world regulate it? 
Well, the, I'd like to talk about, if I talk about the dangers, I'd also like to talk about the possible benefits. The dangers first is, um, uh, the first would be timeline contamination. Uh, actually, we have a, 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 a motto on our website that talks about uh, the Anderson Institute, where history is becoming an experimental science. It's wrong. Actually, since the 1960s, and especially since the 1990s all around the world, history has become an experimental uh, science. Um, one of the challenges is, as we use it, um, the effect, one of the things we've learned that's remarkable is that when you alter events uh, in time or you create fields where you accelerate time or slow down time or, or move information faster forward in time or backward in time, you not only affect that object, you actually affect the construct of reality. So there's the risk without understanding that complex web of interdependencies is that using time control technology can actually redefine individual lives and consciousness. Using it unwisely also can cause transcription errors, is what we like to call them, uh, where unsafe technologies are used, where body parts or even consciousness doesn't fit back together because it um, moved across a boundary layer in time or the technology was just unstable. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, you know, the other thing, there are so many people that look at the good. Um, I, I work with people that I admire, that are becoming my personal heroes, because when they look at this technology, not just in their words, but in their hearts and minds, they see the opportunity, the opportunity for the application of the technology in medical fields to save lives, um, the opportunity to perhaps view and record history to learn from it, the po potential to develop more quickly cures for diseases uh, that cause great disaster and suffering on the earth, or maybe even retrieve future cures uh, to alleviate that disaster and suffering. Um, mm -hmm. But also, at the same time, we have the other interests. And uh, there are concerns. Uh, for example, you know, and we can't fight it uh, because this is the function of nations. Uh, they, they tend to want to keep technology as a strategic advantage. And many people I meet talk more about weaponization of time control technology and even get into discussions about how to prepare for the Earth's first great time war. Uh, to be use a very dramatic statement, but essentially that's what people look at. How can they use it? We even have... Uh, in two countries, we have active programs where people want to run bat battlefield situations, sending information from the future back to the past to understand the results or to tweak decisions made today. Even if it's in a short time frame in the future, they feel having that feedback loop can actually help them better succeed in warfare, which is not the area where we really want to see the technology applied. Mm -hmm. So the bet now. Now let's let's just uh, slow down here because I can I can feel my listeners going. Well, this is all fascinating, but is it real? You know, because a lot of people in the in just the the ordinary everyday blue collar you know working arena. They hear this kind of stuff and they think, they think it's science fiction that it's you know something that you know it's great to see in a movie or it's great to read in a book. But what are the what are the reality? What is the reality of this technology now? Are we able to do this now? Have we been for a while? Are we tweaking things and and, and theories and equipment that we've already been experimenting with? Hmm. Well, most of this remained theoretical <clears throat> until about the 1960s. Before that, we had the work of Einstein, a uh, work of an obscure mathematician. Well, not obscure, not in my world, but he's very well known. Uh, Kurt Gödel, a German mathematician who proposed that uh, you could move uh, to the past. Uh, at, um, you could time travel to the past at speeds slower than the speed of light. In the 1960s is where it really began. In the 1960s, uh, in Russia, they began using, at the Moscow Aviation Institute, their advanced research institute at the time, uh, they began sending information faster than the speed of light, essentially backwards in time. Uh, of course, they also did many experiments in anti-gravity remote viewing. They had a very different outlook on what was acceptable research and development there versus perhaps what we do today. Now. Um, what's really happened, uh, quite interesting, the U.S. government has been involved in this since the 19, I'd say, 70s to some degree. As a matter of fact, I would thank your listeners, and they should thank themselves because, believe it or not, for the last three decades, they've been paying for this research. And now, to be very specific for your listeners who might be skeptical, um, 
you have to take a look at the projects that are funded. For example, take a look just at one location, Princeton University and Dr. Lei Jun Wang. Um, he actually was given funding for a project that was called Superlum Superluminal Propagation of Information. What does it really translate to? Sending information faster than the speed of light backwards in time. And so these projects go on. These projects have been funded at all different kinds of levels, some of it a little bit visible to the public, some of it invisible. Sometimes we just don't take the time to look. But Hillary, what's really exciting now today <clears throat> is that this work is funded on a very wide scale. It's not just the Anderson Institute and S4 and what's happening at Princeton University and Caltech and the University of Connecticut, all places where the government is funding activities today uh, in time control research. It's also Japan. Japan has taken the work at Princeton University and they've added two orders of magnitude of the ability to send information through time. In, in uh, South Korea, uh, actually, believe it or not, tomorrow we open up, we, we open up officially our new research facility just outside of Seoul. Uh, so Korea enters the game. Uh, in India, what a remarkable story, Hillary. Uh, they, their effort is larger than the rest of the world's combined. Uh, it's absolutely amazing what's going on the world, around the world. It's not just theory anymore. It's actual practical application and use of time control technology techniques. They're all very different at these different locations, but they're all very real. What is your personal vision for all of this technology, David? What do you, what do you <clears throat> hope to see happen uh, on, in your heart with all of this? <clears throat> Well, in my heart, I see, I see tremendous opportunity for human society. Uh, on, on one hand, I see the opportunity. This technology is, is, let's call it dangerous. There's a great potential for suffering to be created by this technology, as equally as there's great opportunity for good. What's different about this technology versus technologies like uh, nuclear energy, for example, is that you may not be aware that the technology is being applied. There are those 2%, uh, say, of the population that are sensitive to alterations in historical timelines. But generally speaking, as a population, we're barely aware of the work that's going on, let alone the majority of us are not in tune to sensing these things. What's very different, one of the great things we've learned through our experiments, not just at the Anderson Institute, but these other locations, is that when experiments are run, you actually change the construct of reality even outside of the range of the experiment, <clears throat> which is uh, very difficult to sense or understand. Our hope with the technology, maybe perhaps, is the tremendous good it could bring. Also, the possibility, because of the tremendous risk that it faces, uh, that human society faces with the technology, that it might give us the opportunity to unite and grow together. Um, and maybe help raise our collected effort to work together as a human society and to stop using technologies without understanding the consequences of them. Time control technology is just one, but again, what's different about it is the use of the technology, why it can be scientifically verified to affect reality in ways that you can't predict, are very, very difficult for our limited human senses to perceive. Mm -hmm. And that's the concern today. People ask about, well, how is this going to happen? It already is happening, and the power levels and capabilities of the technologies are growing quickly. Okay, so let's take, for example, let's take, um, <clears throat> give me a, a situation, like describe to me a typical experiment that you guys uh, run that you work with. Describe it to me. Okay, a typical situation, let's talk about the Anderson Institute specifically. Uh, we have a system uh, called a time warp field generator. Uh, we're on our third generation. We've been active with these for about 18 years now. Um, and essentially what we do is we can create in the laboratory using a high energy laser array and uh, a, a lot of other equipment and different types of fields. We can actually create a spherical field where within which we can control the rate of time. We can accelerate it. We can slow it down. And in some special situations, we actually can reverse the time rates. Um, and essentially what we do is we can put objects, whether it be reference inf instrumentation or living organisms, inside this field and accelerate or slow down the time. Uh, some things that we've learned 
And this is stuff that this is work that we've been doing for the last 15 years, since about, let's say, about 1993 or 1994. Uh, one of the things that we've learned, we've learned some remarkable things. Uh, one of them is, is that this notion popularized in the media today about parallel universes is wrong. In India and at the Anderson Institute, uh, we do not see the concept of parallel universes. What we see are multiple dimensions of one reality that we can't sense, um, but we don't see parallel universes. And a good example would be... Um, what does it mean when you travel through t through time? What is the impact if you move backwards in time and then forward again? I like to use the analogy with listeners. Imagine if you walked out your front door and say you had a flower bed in your front yard. If you were to walk, start at one side of your flower bed, walk across the the flower bed and walk back again, you would be re returned right to that exact point in space. However, you've changed the construct of reality. You've actually trampled on some plants that will no longer bloom. You've disrupted some seeds that will now spring into living organisms. You change reality in the construct of reality. And believe it or not, I'm drawing a very simple analogy, but it's a very insightful one in what we're seeing in our experiments. We actually have the ability to say, take a group of plant seedlings, put them inside the chamber, move them backwards in time and forwards again. When we move them backwards, we trigger an event that destroys the uh, the parent generation of, of those seedlings. Those seedlings come back with the same DNA footprint, but the reference set of seedlings that was outside of that, those plant seedlings that are in the laboratory separately, the DNA construct of those seedlings changed. So uh, it's very, very fascinating. What it tells us is, is that that the process of moving through time, no matter how small it is, you actually can change the construct of reality Okay, so we have this very interesting experiment. A, a lot of people are very familiar with, with um, paradoxes when we talk about time control or time travel. One of the most popular is the grandfather paradox. What would happen if I traveled backwards in time and killed my grandfather? Um, my father would no longer be born, so I wasn't born, so therefore I could not travel back in time. So. Uh, since I didn't travel back in time, my grandfather was born, and now I am alive, so I can go back, so this loops. These types of paradoxes, Hillary, uh, really are places where our rational minds bump into their, their own limitations. What we actually see is when we do experiments, when we move an object backwards in time, and if the, if the parent generation or grandfather of that living organism is destroyed, say in the case of a plant seedling, and that living organism that was sent backwards in time does not cease to exist. It continues to live with the same uh, consciousness and energy and genetic makeup for destroyed its prayer, for example, in the case of a, a living plant organism. So that's one of the things we've learned, is that this concept of the grandfather paradox it simply does not hold up in laboratory experiments. Yeah, well, that makes sense. It, it, um, it's very fascinating. I, I'm, I'm kind of hanging on every word that you're saying here. <laughs> um, well, that's kind of you. Well, I, you know, what's fascinating to me, David, is this concept of what you're discovering, you know, the, the theories that are breaking down in your research, such as the parallel universes and how those things aren't exactly what we thought. Now, I, I'm going to ask you this question, and I don't know exactly if this runs into, you know, the work that you do, um, but things, a phenomena like uh, that we experience in the world today, like crop circles, uh, you know, ET contact, those kind of things, in this perspective of what you're doing, how do those things fit in? Could they be time travel instances where, you know, this is moving through time? Or uh, how does it relate to your technology? Absolutely. The short answer is absolutely yes. Uh, how does it relate? Uh, at the Anderson Institute, we're a group of computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians, and teams. We're not experts in these other areas, but I'm pleased to offer an opinion. Uh, I would say that uh, one of the first things that we do recognize, there's a lot of ways we do this in testing, but one of the things we recognize, and it's one of our, our favorite quotes that we use with college students, is we remind them, we do not, we do not see our universe 
as it is. We see the universe as we are. And we have to understand how we see it first before we can really answer, answer that question. Um, we, we, we are functions of our biological and cultural evolution, and that blinds us to truly understanding and seeing uh, the universe. We actually, with our senses and our human mind, the way it operates, we only see a very microscopic part of this beautiful macroscopic universe. And while we don't believe in parallel universes, we do clearly see that there are dimensions, many, many dimensions, uh, and, and parallel realities, if you will, that we uh, cannot sense. And for your listeners to make it simple, let's take, let's move back 15 years and put the old television set on front of the table in front of us. And that old television set, what it would do before the days of cable TV and the Internet, there would be information and energy waves flying through the air. And if I wanted to tune into a channel, I'd reach up and I'd grab the tuner and I'd move it to a channel. And as I did that, that television set and tuner would tap into that information and energy flying through the air, and it would make me be able to view and understand it. And that's what our human minds are. Our human minds are like a television tuner. We see clearly out of our experiments that the universe truly is a dynamic web of information and energy and absolutely yes everything is interconnected the challenge is 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 that our senses are limited our senses um number one have our our sense only a very very small part of that macroscopic universe the other thing that's very difficult is the human mind and this is the greatest challenge when we work with college students is to teach them that they have to overcome their limitations the human mind's function if you ask a scientist in that field is to rationalize what its body senses perceive with its own belief system so by nature the function of the human mind is limited and to grow and to become a good scientist in this field we have to be able to recognize that limitation, and once you do, you begin to grow from there. But those are two, two of the, the biggest things we've learned um, mm-hmm. about from our work. Now, when you said before earlier that uh, other countries are experimenting with the use of sending information through this time control capabilities, what exactly does that mean, and how do they do that? Well, uh, you know, it, it really is a great question. For, for your listeners, um, uh, let's, let's talk about it. Now, I'll use an example. Um, there's a phenomenon, and I'll explain it a, a, a little more basically. Uh, it's called quantum tunneling. And essentially what it is uh, in physics, it, it's what's called an evanescent wave coupling effect. It occurs in, what, in, in quantum mechanics. And essentially, uh, when you use the correct wavelength, length to carry information and you use the right type of medium or material to pass it through, it actually is possible to pass parts of signals faster than light, essentially backwards in time. Uh, This is very real, by the way. This first was done in the Soviet Union back in the 1960s. Uh, In the 1990s, actually, the the NEC funded under U.S. government funding, again, thank you taxpayers who are listening to this show, uh, an experiment where uh, Princeton University actually set up a 10 centimeter cesium chamber, a chamber filled with cesium. They injected a signal into one side of the chamber. As the information entered and passed through the chamber, what was fascinating is the information actually finished leaving the chamber before it finished entering. And that's an effect uh, that occurs from a phenomenon called quantum entanglement or quantum tunneling. And this actually is another proof that, that in many ways, um, we are connected, even when objects or, 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 or people or consciousness, or consciousness are separated at distance, even that require greater than the speed of light communication. Now, essentially what that allows to do uh, at that time was to pass information faster than the light backwards in time. And what Japan has been doing uh, at their facility north of Kyoto City is really expanding the capability. And there's a lot of value in that if you think about it. The ability to send information from the future to the past. Imagine if you had a radio receiver that could tune one minute into the future, or maybe not so impressive. But what if you could tune 10 minutes into the future or 10 days into the future? How could you affect, how could you use that type of technology for good? Or how could you use that type of uh, technology for selfish gain? 
Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difference between doing this with technology and using our own psychic abilities to do this in, you know, in the sense of remote viewing or tapping into our intuition? Can we achieve the same thing? Well, uh, now we get into area of opinion because, like you, Hillary, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but I will share you an opinion. We truly believe um, that that first off, when we see a convergence happening, we truly believe that why many people sit and they talk about the metaphysical abilities to control time, views of time and religion or art or spirituality, talk about different technologies um, and different applications of technologies, the different philosophical views of time, and they all seem to have their own different little islands and camps. What we truly believe, number one, is that as the true nature of time and our place in it begins to unfold more quickly, number one, what we're going to see is that all those islands and groups are looking at the same reality uh, just from a from a different perspective so we believe uh, it, it, it's all one and the same that the true nature of time manifests itself in many different ways there's many ways to looking at it and for your listeners what I'd encourage them is please don't judge if you want to truly understand and become a student of the nature of time you have to study it from every perspective from the aspect yeah. of culture um, and technology and philosophy and religion and art my next question to you, David, was going to be, what are the spiritual implications of this kind of... Uh, it feels to me like uh, it is an actual evolution of our abilities to be able to understand and navigate these things, not only from a scientific perspective, but also from a spiritual perspective. What are the implications spiritually onto something like this? You know, you have a lot of people in this world right now, in the present moment, who are very divided because of religious beliefs. Not only that, but political differences and, all, and racial differences and the, all the things we're still struggling with as a culture now, planet-wise. What are the implications of that if this kind of thing, you, know, you have the high hopes that will bring people together, um, but what are some of the ramifications on the spiritual side of this? Hmm. Positive and negative. Positive and negative. Let's talk about one negative that many people might not sense or see, but um, it's a negative that's discussed by many government agencies as they talk about disclosure plans or, or processes for the technology. One of the biggest is social unrest, believe it or not. One of the concerns is that many of these religious beliefs today uh, are based upon very, very critical events in history. Believe it or not, India, in uh, the state of Maharashtra, their facility there, is actually completing their development of uh, systems of drones, that they actually want to send drones backwards in time to study and record history. What happens if they record key moments in the history of certain religions and they're proved to be false or they're proved to be true? There's a social unrest and the ramifications from that that could be quite profound. But at the same time, Let's talk about the spiritual implications uh, from, from, from a positive standpoint. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing, one of the reasons, not only do we have differences across religions, uh, we have differences uh, in our daily lives here. Uh, let's just talk about this country, country here. We have people who've become very ingrained, where science has become their religion, and only if they can touch it, see it, or see it on the TV, they don't believe it's true. Um, they basically shrunk all the magic in the world to the size of their daily routine and material possessions. What's really happening is fascinating to me. Science now today, what's coming out of the, the laboratories, not just in time control technology facilities around the world, but in the particle accelerators and super colliders, has more in common with the ancient beliefs of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism than it does with the classical science uh, that we all studied in school. And what's amazing for the first time, the spiritual implication to me is we see science, religion, and spirituality converging, where basically they're coming to that single point where science is now demonstrating that those crazy ideas, that the world is a dynamic web of energy and that we're all connected, they're proving it's true. And it's coming now together to a single answer and truth about our reality and place in this universe that both scientists and spiritualists can understand on common ground. So I do believe it has an opportunity to unite at the same time to reach that point we have to be able to forget about 
these artificial lines we create across the borders of nations, across geography and religious beliefs, and start working together as a single human society um, as we look for that. And that's a very difficult path for this, the people of these, this planet to walk. Yes, I agree. I also think that it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I also think that you had a, a moment in time uh, when that was, you know, the, the scientific and spiritual aspects were divided uh, intentionally so that we wouldn't get to that point um, necessarily. But, you know, I, I, I want to kind of bring it back to a practical level, David. And so for a typical person, an average person just going about their day, you know, headed to work, driving through, you know, the highway and how would they how would they experience could this happen to somebody you know i mean from from what i'm list, been listening to the picture i get in my mind is you know when we have synchronistic moments or when we have deja vu experiences you know um are these examples of maybe our time reality around us being affected I think in many cases, our, our belief is is that a lot of these phenomenon, first off, uh, yes, we do believe that there are special situations, though very rare, where uh, the energy that allows us to, the naturally occurring energy that allows us to create these fields could actually occur not in a man-made fashion, but in a natural fashion. So we do believe it could naturally occur. When you talk about these other phenomenon and awarenesses, um, do we believe that it's possible people have viewed time travelers from the distant future, yes. Also, we have to remember that a lot of these other phenomenon like deja vu and, and, and others, we have to remember the discussion about our senses. Our senses are flawed. We're walking around blind for the most part, sensing a very, very small fragment of a much greater universe with many, many other dimensions of reality within this, this single universe. And many of these moments are places perhaps where we grow. Uh, as a matter of fact, I met with a spiritual leader, it must have been about two months ago, and we had a discussion about a deja vu. And uh, he said it's, it's considered to be, in, in, in their beliefs, to be considered a great gift. It's, it's a step in growth when you have those moments because essentially it's allowed your mind to tune into other dimensions. So we do believe um, that many of these phenomenon and I hate to say it this way because I don't like the words, will be described and shown to be very, very rational and proven using the scientific method. Uh, Why it may take several years, uh, it will come. And we're seeing some of those proofs already today. Yeah. Are you still there, Hillary? Wait, to go into... Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you just fine. (laughs) Maybe we just skipped a moment in time, David. (laughs) It's possible. (laughs) <laughs> you never know. Well, that's my question is, you know, I mean, I mean, for the average seeker, you know, looking into all of these things, you know, with the, the age of information that we're in, you know, what would be the intention of sending information back to you explain that the learning aspect and stuff like that. But. It would seem to me, like, for example, okay, I'm kind of all over the place here. Like an event, like let's take 9-11, like something really drastic that changed uh, reality for people on a worldwide level. Now, is it possible that using this technology, we could go back in time to avoid that kind of situation? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yes. With the one provision, which 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 brings up the risk, is that when you change an event, many people are, ter- are familiar with the term ripple effect or butterfly effect, the phenomenon that when a butterfly beats its wings on one side of the planet, it creates a chain reaction of events that turns into a hurricane on the other side of the world, causing great disaster and suffering. This is our concern. We see tremendous opportunity. For example, how about the opportunity to, to, to send information, to retrieve information to the future, to bring back cures for diseases like diabetes, AIDS, and cancer. It could have avoided so much disaster and suffering. To, uh, to retrieve information to avoid man-made disasters like 9-11 or naturally occurring disasters that cause great uh, human suffering. We can do that. At the same time, the challenge becomes every time, every single time a time control technology is activated, not just at the Anderson Institute, but at these other facilities, these, the, the construct of reality is affected. And why we like to think, and our colleagues like to think, that they're doing it in controlled manners, every action they take 
can cause uh, dramatic ripple effects or butterfly effects. People talk about sending drones in the past to record history or into the future to do the same. What about the possibility of bringing back harmful microbes or viruses, uh, either introducing them to the past or future or bringing them back from the past or the future? Uh, potential risk for extinction of the human race. It, it, it comes back to the basic principle that while an action may seem good, uh, we need to understand the results. And, and that is a very complex web of interdependencies that have to be considered that's probably beyond our capacity for thinking and reasoning today, which brings up the danger in the use of the technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is why so, as a human society we need to decide this as a whole on where we take risks and what type of risks are acceptable. Well, that's a big that's a big step, David. I mean, I, I have to say, I'm I'm a little skeptical of trusting you know this kind of technology in today's governments and and those kinds of things because we've been, we've seen what they've done with other uh, different projects and different technologies and and that they've kept from people and you know they have definitely steered it away towards a more military you know purpose versus a you know a, uh, raising the consciousness and and uh, helping humanity. There's a whole lot of stuff suffering on this planet, uh, and there's a lot of technologies out there that can help that aren't released and aren't disclosed and aren't transparent, and the money that we pay as taxpayers, you know, that we think is funding, you know, certain projects are going off to black budget profit, you know, uh, projects that are funding, you know, research into things like this that we don't know is happening. So the average person out there isn't aware that this is happening. I mean, you can go, a mother can go to, a, you know, their son's soccer game, and the reality of what's happening in the world and the research and the levels of things that we're actually creating, uh, they don't have a clue. They don't have this, a clue. And, and this is uh, this is so important. It's not just the money hidden on the black projects. Of course, it happens. We know that happens. That's uh, that, that's that's a fact of life. Uh, but it's also happening in a public eye, and that's one of the reasons why we're stepping forward. I agree you, with you're you. You're breaking up there. I'm sorry, oh. David. We didn't oh. catch that last part. I, I you, you broke yeah. up on me. I'd like you to repeat that, please. Oh sure. Um, you know, we, we, we do see, um, we do see that people don't recognize this. And it's not just the black projects that are being funded. There are, there are projects that are being funded closer to the public eye. But, but this is really the challenge. Uh, as, as individuals, um, this is a technology that we may not see the effect of. Uh, we talked about the fact that using the technology can change the makeup of reality and that we don't understand the impact on individuals, the human race, or the entire planet. And like you said, Said, uh, there are many benefits, but who's going to judge what is really useful? Um, yeah. This complex web of interdependence is beyond our capacity to predict the impact today. We don't know every time we use the technology, will it affect human evolution? Uh, when we manipulate history, are we going to force a very unnatural and a quick rate of change that causes harm and suffering or good? You know, we can't turn our back on this now, Hillary. So many people ask us, why don't you just stop? because it's not just the Anderson Institute. Uh, we simply now have to take on this challenge, the one that you raised. Uh, it's easy to drive transparency and disclosure. Okay, it's not easy, it's hard work. We have to, we have to educate people and make people aware. And Hillary, through work of, like your shows, we have to make people want to be aware of what's yeah. going on. Yeah. After well, that, that, though... David, let me let me interrupt for a second here. Now, who do you think, you know, ultimately when this is actually documented and developed and, and we have a full-blown system of being able to do this, my concern is who is going to be in charge of that technology? Because you're doing such a wonderful job of bringing this to a public awareness level where people can, you know, you're open, people can come and, and learn with your institute and understand this technology. But my fear is, honestly, and I think a lot of other people are probably thinking the same thing, especially listening to this, is when it actually is all out there, you know, who is going to be in charge of it? Is it, is it going to be you and your company or is it going to be, you know, every all these other places, you know, around the world, but who, who ultimately is going to be in charge? Well, um... I mean, we're fighting. We're fighting. We're fighting over the technology in the Gulf of Mexico to stop an oil spill. One, one oil spill on the planet, yes. and nobody, nobody can get their act together. And everybody's keeping quiet. And there's so much secrecy, and there's so much disinformation, and, and it's like a giant PR campaign. What, what, what makes this kind of 
very incredibly powerful technology that much more able to be man- managed with ethics. This this is this is the the greatest challenge. Uh, um, who controls the technology? Which I, I almost don't even like the statement or the question, but it's one that has to be answered. Is what do we do with this new knowledge? We have the ability to look in the future to change the past. What do we do with this? How do we handle it? Who should given, be given access to it? Uh, these are just a few of the questions that needed to be asked, and we need very serious answers because people's life choices and indeed maybe even their self-identity in even existence can be significant, significantly affected. So who should be afforded access to this technology and knowledge? One of the challenges is in transparency and disclosure, of course, are governments and nations. Just like the human mind, the, the na- nation has a function. It's number one to survive and number two to prosper. I might not like that, but that's that's reality of the yeah. present situation in society today. And, and one of the fundamental tenets of strategy, whether you talk about military warfare strategy or business strategy or government strategy, is you keep your technology a secret. So we've got to get it out in the open. But what do we do? This is the challenge, is we can get transparency and disclosure. We can drive an education with it. We can even later monitor the technology. But what we need now is to form a global moral compass, is what we like to call it, one that will be used to guide not just the future use of the technology, but the future development. It has to span lines of religion, of politics, of nations and governments and private enterprise. And it really truly has to be guided by human society as a whole and human consciousness as a whole. That's something we've never been able to accomplish in the history of human society on this planet. And I agree, it's a very difficult challenge. At the same time, while we might have to go through some pain to get there, it's something we have to do. And by the way, it's not just about time control technology. We experiment as a human race with technologies all around the world that could force a very unnatural rate of change on human society with profound negative catastrophic impacts. We have to stop as a human society using technologies without first understanding what are the consequences of using them, number one. And number two... Yeah, because the first thing that comes to my mind, David, is, is you know, an average person like myself wouldn't have access to this technology. Unless, of course, I was studying with you in your, you know, in your, in your institute or, you know, making an active effort to get into the field. But, I mean, how would it be practical, practical to... what? Pra- What's the practical use to an everyday, ordinary person? Well, uh, the practical use... uh well, first off, I think driving the awareness is key. And by the way, that's the whole point of the Hillary Ramo show. <laughs> You're driving awareness <laughs> and understanding of these issues. So when you ask me, how are we going to solve this problem? I'm simply going to defer it to you, Hillary, and I'm going to go uh, <laughs> take a nice long walk on the, in the desert. But, um, uh, but you know, awareness, awareness. Uh, awareness is such a key. What does it mean to individuals? If as a human society as a whole, we can learn as an individual. What's the benefit? Number one, as an individual, we can learn. Most people don't even understand the, uh, how much they don't know about time. And, 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 and just a quick exercise for your listeners. I know we're running out of time, but one of my favorite philosophers about on time is St. Augustine, and he talked about time being an illusionary product of your mind. You talk about your listeners early, Hillary, walking to work or driving to work. I would challenge them. When they're walking down the street, do St. Augustine's experiment. Walk up to somebody, a friend or a stranger, and ask them if they know what time is, and they're going to say yes. And then ask them to, them to explain it to you. A simple little experiment. Simply ask them to explain it to you, and you'll see them babble at a total loss for words. Um, and this is something that dominates our culture. And by the way, it's not just one answer within culture. We have cultures on this planet that believe all time exists, past, present, present and future at the same point. We have time, cultures even here in the United States, like with the Navajo Indian Indians, where in their culture they have no reference in their language to the past and the future. They don't talk about in events happening in time, they only talk about the quality of that event, not its temporal quality. Cultures have evolved. Just because we in the United States say time is linear, we scoff at people who say past and present and future don't exist, they're all here at once, or that time is a circle. Well, the people, many people in Asia laugh at our concepts that time is believed to be linear, um, even within our culture. And I'm sharing this because I want your listeners to really challenge themselves first to understand how remarkable 
our lack of understanding of the true nature of time is in our place in it. And that's the first to be become interested to want to learn. And we'll do our best at the Anderson Institute to make inf information available for free to people to study and learn. And that's the first thing they need to do. How it will benefit them, um, uh, I think only the future will tell, or maybe the past. Yeah, I, and for those of you listening, uh, David's website is andersoninstitute.com. There's a link on my radio homepage. I've also posted it several times on my Facebook page. For those of you who are on there with me, uh, there's a, I, I highly recommend the articles on there. He, he gives a lot of information. David, I give you a lot of credit because you are taking on an extraordinarily huge undertaking by getting this information out, by working on this topic, by, you know, I, 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 I see two very distinct paths, you know, developing out of this, and I, and I hope that we take the higher road because, you know, I hate to say it, but there's just, there's just so many different possibilities for where this could go to. And I think it's important for people to really understand, and I want my listeners to really listen to this statement, that it, awareness really is the key. We cannot stick our heads in the sand anymore and pretend that the world is just going round and round and nothing is changing, nothing's happening. I think as far as technology goes, we are so over the top advanced that what we think we are right now. You know, an iPod comes out or a new phone comes out and we think, oh, wow, it's so great. We have gone beyond that so much to the point where people really need to start researching and investigating into their own, uh, into this other side kind of feel to these things. And that they're real. They're real. And so, David, I want to I want to commend you and your research and your work and what you're doing and your intentions are very high and, and wonderful and I think you really are doing a wonderful thing. Um, did you expect yourself to get into at this level when you started to work into this field? Did you think it was going to go global and that you would have so many different operations in different countries? Well, actually, uh, uh, I would say no. Uh, when I started as a scientist with uh, Air Force Systems Command, I, I did not even uh, have a desire to get into this field. I actually stumbled into it by accident through the course of some other uh, projects that I was assigned to. Um, I'm very happy to walk this path. Uh, uh, it means a lot to me. I've grown a lot personally, and, and the people around uh, who experience uh, the work that's being done, and, and this is why I really appreciate your words about encouraging your listeners to learn and study. One of the greatest benefits for everybody, I didn't answer the question well, is that when you study this and you really learn what is coming out of this, it really opens the door for so much personal growth and awakening on a spiritual level or even the scientific level. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. It's been a great course. Um, it's been difficult. Uh, is you can imagine, uh, and I, I have to tell your listeners, you, you can't ever underestimate the power and the influence that private enterprise and government interest want to exercise on technologies like this. Their aspirations are very high. They want to control it for specific goals, some of them very noble, some of them we might say are maybe not optimum for human society as a whole, uh, to say that very kindly. Um, that is very kindly. That's a very kind statement, I have to say. That's putting it very, very pretty. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I could use I could use other words, Hillary. I could, I, uh, I could too. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, I, actually, maybe we talk about that just for a second because it'd be very easy to put labels of of good and evil, uh, good and bad, on 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 some of the different positions. But if we really accept the ancient wisdom and what many spiritual practitioners believe today, and now what science is proving today that we're all connected, we're all one part of the great whole, and there's not one thing anybody can do that doesn't affect uh, another component of reality. When we think about that, both good and evil become part of all of us as a whole. And many times human society, if you look at history, and, and it's tragic, uh, human society has used labels of good and evil to justify doing very bad things. And so we, you know, it, it's good to avoid it. At the same time, uh, we really try not to support and try to convince people who see using the technology for personal or commercial profit or for weaponization not to do that. Um, See now, my first my first gut instinct would be that the military would be so wonderfully supportive of this kind of research because they want to understand how it can be used as a weapon because that is the paradigm and mindset 
for that kind of organization. So it's almost like, well, you know, it's, it's, you would need like a very wonderfully evolved, uh, wisdom filled kind of council of people who have higher, you know, have a higher level of integrity when it comes to these kinds of things to be in control of this. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if I really believe that the military is capable of taking over some kind of technology like this and using it for the highest good. I think the highest good that this stuff has is, is extraordinary, profound, and it has a lot of potential to wake things up. And again, I go back to my original statement at the beginning of the show with Nikola Tesla's intention with working with these wonderful things. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to look into the future, David, you know, 200 years down the road and say David Lewis Anderson was another Nikola Tesla. He had these incredible high hopes and did these incredible things. And then all of a sudden it goes underground and it's, it's you know, people have to fight for your information to come out so that the higher level, the higher integrity of your research Research is able to do that. Have you been able to see into the future to see if that's what's going to happen for me? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'd like to know, really. Well, I tell you, our, our solution right now is uh, we actually have a concept that we're putting together with scientists in uh, three other countries for the proposal for a international world time council, and uh, that's a it's a good question. Who 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 leads on that council? I think maybe we should tap into the global network you have on the the, the Hillary Ramo uh, radio show here, and uh, you have some pretty uh, very interesting spiritual leaders I know who follow your work. But um, we, um, you know, it, 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 it's a tough question. And I am concerned. Uh, uh, have we looked into the future to see the outcome? Remember, the future is not uh, is not certain. Every thought, every focus we have, not just every thought, not just every action, every thought and every focus we have actually becomes our reality and affects reality. So people do have the potential to do this. And I know his, history says that as a human society, we've had to go through a lot of pain to reach new levels of growth in society and new levels of good, um, uh, save for human consciousness. But we tend to do that. And I just hope that the suffering we go through to overcome this and manage these risks um, are, are not as severe as some mm-hmm. that we faced in the past. Well, we are definitely going through a wonderful uh, death dance of an old world that no longer serves us. And and my my uh, the one thing I feel compelled to say to you, David, in, in the last moments of the show is to make sure that the indigenous elders from you know different cultures are included on that council because they have always maintained a level of very high integrity with the knowledge that they've carried. And I think they would make a very wonderful addition to that council that that oversees that. And and I and I think that you know. If you're if you're able to pull that together and, and and do that, and it's able to stay on that level, this is wonderful implications for our world, and and it may very well be the next step in our evolution that we're supposed to be. But you, you know, be, tread carefully. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Hillary, your, your comment about uh, you know a committee of, of spiritual elders, um, you know, perhaps you're you're describing what the the future uh, new world government should be. And if you think about, and I don't know as many as you do. I'm lucky, I'm fortunate, I've met with some spiritual leaders and we've discussed these issues. Um, But one thing for certain, if spiritual leaders were leading the world government, many of the problems and many of the suffering and the pain that that human society feels today uh, would, uh, would go away. And we would see tremendous growth on on, uh, on personal and a, and also on a global consciousness basis. Well, from your your lips to uh, the ears of whatever's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me, David. We're out of time, and I have to say, any, you know, once again, uh, AndersonInstitute.com uh, for those interested in learning more about it. David, thanks so much for spending the last hour with me uh, co- conversating about these fabulous and wonderful topics. It's been a pleasure. It was an, it was an absolute pleasure, Hillary. Thank you so much. And for everybody listening, until next time, live well, namaste. Next week, we have David Icke returning to talk about many things. Enjoy. Have a wonderful week.